The conclusion of the first report left no doubt that what was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947 was debris from a formerly top secret Army Air Forces research project code name Mogul. It's easy to lie to the American people. Lying in government has almost become institutionalized in American government. And it's quite easy to lie to the American public because they don't do their homework and they don't pay attention. Reconnaissance Project Mogul, a project took place in New Mexico in 1947. This is some equipment associated with Project Mogul. There's the famous box kite that became the famous flying disc. The weather balloons that were on the, on the balloon train. That's the tinfoil paper, rubber, and sticks that they recovered in the desert near New Mexico. Charles Moore was the technician responsible for releasing the balloon found by Brazel. The balloon that uh, we think was recovered on the Foster Ranch uh, was launched on the, about 3 o'clock in the morning on June 4th, 1947. And when the balloons came back to ground after some of them burst, they dragged across the ground and they shed pieces as they went. But there was, no, there was not a crash uh, as far as we can determine. It was, it was just a gentle landing that the wind then dragged the remaining balloons that were inflated across the ground. Although the purpose of Project Mogul was top secret, uh, all of the equipment that was used individually uh, and collectively was unclassified. Only the purpose of the use of that equipment was security classified, and the equipment was certainly expendable. We, uh, there, there was no reason to use it again. There, there was no such thing known as a Mogul balloon because at first we used ordinary meteorological balloons. There wasn't anything about the balloon that would merit special security of the balloon itself once it was launched. I'm convinced beyond any doubt that what happened at Roswell was that a Project Mogul train of weather balloons, about 23 weather balloons, carrying several aluminum foil radar targets so it could be tracked, crashed on the ranch of a man known as Mac Brazel. I was not out at the ranch at the time, and I picked up an Albuquerque paper, and here's my dad's picture looking at me, and I thought, well, I wonder what he's done now. <laughs> so I went on to, to read the article, and I told Shirley, I said, well, I guess I better go out to the ranch, because they said that he, the Air Force had asked him to stay in Roswell. Anyway, they swore dad to secrecy, and I went out to the ranch and stayed until he got back, and I asked him, 
what he'd got into and oh he says I found a bunch of trash and uh, so he went on to tell me it was you know, a bunch of sticks and twine string he says and he said on some of these sticks why there was uh, oh he says uh, Japanese or Chinese figures you know mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, he couldn't even start to show me what it was, what it was like, you know. Mm -hmm. And I kept asking him questions, and, and he said, well, he said, I told the Air Force I wouldn't tell anybody. He said, you're probably better off without knowing. He did show me where he had found this wreckage. Mm -hmm. and. So, and of course, riding horseback, you see lots of things, you know. Only 22 years old at the time, Bill could not help but be intrigued by his dad's discovery of the strange materials in this field. He searched for and found some remnants of the crashed object. And I was talking about it. I went into Corona and I was sitting there in a beer joint and I got to these of course, my friends is asking me if I'd found any more or anything like this. And I said, well, I picked up a few scraps, uh, about a cigar box full. And uh, somebody, I don't know, must have informed the Air Force because first thing I know, I have visitors. And they say they'd like to have this material. And they didn't tell me they'd confiscate it. They just said, well, like we're going to have it one way or the other, you know. Uh, all of the equipment that was used individually uh, and collectively was unclassified. There wasn't anything about the balloon that would merit special security of the balloon itself once it was launched. According to my dad, there was a bad thunderstorm the night before, and the next day he was out on the ranch, and he found this debris. And he picked it all up in his pickup and was talking to people, and, of course, there was some talk about UFOs. He was going to Roswell, and as far as I know, he got in touch with the Sheriff's Department. They, in turn, called the Air Force. Then the Air Force got with Dad and uh, swore him to secrecy, and they came out to the ranch and picked up this debris. He said that's what the Air Force tried to make him believe, that it was a weather balloon. And he said, Bill, he said it was not a weather balloon. He said, I don't know what it was. But he said it was something altogether different and much bigger. Individuals who recovered uh, components of the Project Mogul uh, balloon train, uh, if they indeed were contacted by the Air Force, there's no evidence to support that they were, if they were contacted, it would not be unusual for them to be instructed not to discuss uh, the objects they found. The radar reflectors were manufactured during World War II, during a time of great shortage in the United States. And this particular contract was given to a, a toy company. These were very, uh, they were made of balsa wood and tin foil. And part of the tape that they used to reinforce the seam were, was actually tape that they used in manufacture of toys. And so it did have uh, colorful symbols on it. And when people found these objects in New Mexico, they were, they were definitely surprised to find them and wouldn't know what they were. Major Jesse Marcel, the chief intelligence officer at the base, was assigned the task of collecting the debris from the crash site. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all air activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So we proceeded to pick up the parts. A lot of it had a lot of little members with symbols 
that to me I call them hieroglyphics because I could not interpret them, could not be read. They were just like symbols of something that meant something. We had to follow the rancher out there. With just verbal directions, we never would have found it. There was so much of it. It was scattered over such a vast area. So we proceeded to pick up as much of the debris as we could, loaded in our wagon. We filled that up. It took us a good part of the day to do that because uh, there's such small fragments that we had to do a lot of picking. We found a piece of metal uh, about a, far, a foot and a half to two feet wide and about, about two or three feet long. It felt like you had nothing in your hands. It wasn't any thicker than the foil out of a pack of cigarettes. The thing about that uh, got me is that you couldn't even bend it. You couldn't bend it. Even with a sledgehammer would bounce off it. So I knew that I had never seen anything like that before. And as of, as of now, I don't know what it was. Uh, he simply uh, could not identify it. He used to bring some weather balloons home for me to play with, these big envelopes. And uh, uh, so what this was is there's no balloon component to the wreckage that we saw. And I guess uh, other people say that, well, it was a radar target. Well, he went to radar school to study radar uh, reflectors and things like that. And, and if it was that, he would have not even bothered to show it to us. The balloons that we used on the early June flights were made of neoprene. They were large size uh, meteorological balloons of the sort that are used to carry radio sons uh, to measure temperature, pressure, and humidity in the upper air. The radar targets were some special pre-production models that uh, were left in stock at Fort Monmouth after the war. And they consisted of aluminum foil uh, laminated onto a fairly tough uh, parchment-like white paper. And they were deployed on sticks of balsa wood. He simply uh, could not identify it. He simply uh, could not identify it. Other parts of the debris were more unusual, though. There was some beams, and I recall them as being metal. Other people recall them as being wood, but my recollection is these were metal beams. Uh, I don't think they're wood because I very, was very familiar with balsa wood because I built balsa wood models all that time. The strangest thing in, in the whole debris that I, the whole types of debris that I saw was the I beam or the beam. Uh, it was a metal rod, uh, 12 to 18 inches long, with the purple violet hue. Uh, figures written along the inner surface. When I picked this beam up off the uh, kitchen floor, I looked at it and really didn't see anything too unusual until I held it up like this to get the light from the overhead light that was over my shoulder reflecting along the inner surface. And that's when I saw the uh, these symbols. This is what I would like to uh, show you. In here, this is the uh, photograph of the debris that was seen in General Ramey's office at Carswell Air Force Base in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. This is my father holding up uh, what is very obviously parts of a uh, radar target with uh, balloon debris. In here you see balsa wood fragments. You have actually parts of the balloon envelope in of itself. And uh, you have what looks like paperback metal foil. And to emphasize this, this is not what was seen on the floor of our kitchen that evening or that late uh, early morning hours in 1947. This is totally different. Marcel was instead ordered to pose with wood, foil, and rubber debris from a conventional weather balloon. All I could do is keep a mouth shut. And General Ramey is the one who told the newspapers what it was and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, which we, we both knew differently. This is, this is not consistent with the facts. Uh, we, we obtained the original photographs and examined them in detail, uh, had them closely scrutinized. The objects that were photographed were indeed elements of radar reflectors and weather balloons, and there's no evidence to support any of the allegations that these objects were switched at any time. What we know today as the Roswell incident it's really very similar to a fish story. What started as a fish this big has now grown over the years to this big, bigger, and bigger. And I get a notice, uh, a call, telephone call. And they said, uh, the general would like you to come over to his office. 
and identify something. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't leave here. I'm the only forecaster here, and there'll be airplanes coming in, there'll be airplanes calling in into flight service. I just can't leave. Okay, everything done. About five minutes later, the telephone rings again. And said, this is General Ramey. He says, get your ass over to my office. He says, if you got a car, drive it. If you haven't, take the first car with a key in it and get over here. Aye, aye, sir. So I went into the general's office, and here's all this crap on the floor, like in all those pictures. And I says, is that your flying saucer? And they said, well, yes, it is. And I said, well, that's a bunch of horse pucky. I said, that's a Ray one sound, target and a balloon in there. And if it isn't, I said, I would eat it without salt or pepper. I know what that is. Well, there's certainly no evidence that balsa uh, wood and, and uh, uh, aluminum foil uh, are the sorts of things that spacecraft would be made of. So I, I, think, I think it's highly probable that, uh, that uh, our balloon caused that incident. Colonel Thomas DuBose, who was also ordered to pose with the fake debris, describes how an iron curtain of secrecy slammed down. This is the highest priority you can exhibit, and you will say nothing. More than top secret, as he said. Beyond that, this is the story we're going to tell the public. It was a cover story, the balloon part of it. In order, we don't have any more inquiries about what we picked up on the desert. Got the telephone call from Colonel Blanchard, and in essence, he told me that uh, we had an, he had in his possession a flying saucer or parts thereof. Gave me a little bit of idea where it came from, and <clears throat> ranch north, west of Roswell. And then stated that uh, Major Marcel, Jesse Marcel, who was our base intelligence officer, was going to fly it to Fort Worth to turn it over to General Roger Ramey, who was commander, commanding general of the 8th Air Force at that time in Fort Worth. He told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time. Would you have any reason to believe that Colonel Blanchard would have mistaken this material for being any form of weather balloon or observation device? I don't think there's a one chance in a billion that he would not have recognized a weather balloon. And uh, he was not, he was a West Point graduate, class of 37 as best I recall. Uh, that would have been the end of that. He wouldn't have gone 
anywhere with it. He would have told uh, Major Marcel, uh, this is a weather balloon. Then again, Major Marcel would have known that it wasn't a weather balloon. That was my next question. Is it possible that Mar Major Marcel would have been misled? Or no. Misled? Is it possible that Major uh, Colonel Blanchard might have been misinformed by somebody who told them about, told him about what this wreckage was without having seen it for himself? I would doubt that very much. I don't think uh, he would have uh, taken the actions he did by taking, going down to operations with it. Uh, if he was there in the operations building, he certainly saw it. Between the two of them, I'm certain that one or the other would have called the other one's hand if it uh, was a weather balloon. He simply uh, could not identify it. In 1947, I was uh, at the air base in Roswell. I was in the military and I was first lieutenant at the time. I was assistant flying safety officer. I was assistant base operations officer. And I was assistant group operations officer. Now the group was the 509th bomb group. And Colonel Blanchard drove up and came in and asked, is the aircraft ready? And I and one other fellow there said, yes, it's sitting right out front, ready to go. And with this, he turned, stepped out and back into the hallway and w waved to some people outdoors and still sitting in the automobiles. They came in the front door, straight down the hallway and right out onto the ramp to climb into the airplane. And these were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed uh, flying saucer at that time, a UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. And it was very short, very quick. Uh, Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the uh, ops office. And I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see too. <laughs> Maybe if I hadn't said that to him, made it obvious that I was there, uh, I would not have been shipped out two weeks later. <laughs> uh, what was his immediate response to your request? Well, he just turned and if you knew Colonel Blanchard, and he, when he went on to become three-star general and vice chief of staff, uh, he was a very commanding presence, and uh, he, was a, he was a good officer, a, a real leader. And when he said he wanted something, people said, yes, sir, and, and it wasn't just because he was the military. Uh, so he just turned and looked at me, and he did turn sideways so that I could half step into the doorway and watch the fellows go through. And what I, thus I saw them carrying certain pieces of these metals, uh, items, and uh, as I've described to other people when asked, they, uh, they had one piece that was, oh, I like to say uh, 18 by 24 inch or coffee table top size, uh, brushed stainless steel in color. Maybe if you think of the uh, common aluminum foil roll today when you pull it out, uh, one side's real reflective, but that's not what it was. It was the like the opposite side, which is rather dull. It doesn't have great reflective power. And I've heard it mentioned now for so many times about the uh, I-beam with the markings on it and so forth. And I actually saw that piece of I-beam being carried through and, and saw the markings. But it was a case of here it was and there it went. And, uh, Very quick. That was all I got to see. I was shipped out to the Philippines. How soon after? Two weeks, was it? Within two weeks. Was that, was that unexpected? While it developed, it was unexpected. Uh, these things occurred off and on to people. But there was a telegram, a TWX called the military, came in from 8th Air Force that said, 
urgent need for one each flying safety officer, MOS number such and such, to report to Clark Field in the Philippines. And they turn around and, and uh, look. Well, I, I'm not even sure, but what it might have had my name on because I was the only weights and balance officer on that base. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was shipped out, going to Clark Field in the Philippines uh, because of being weights and balance officer. The sergeant of the guard and the guards, all of them, who were surrounded the site, swept the area and picked the pieces up, they were all shipped out. And every one of us went to a different base someplace around the world so that no two of us were together. I got to Clark Field and they didn't need a weights and balance officer. They had never asked for one. <laughs> I said, well, that's what this telegram says. And they said, we don't care what that says. We, we don't need one. We've got one. And uh, we don't need another one. And they said, uh, what else do you do? In 1965, Butch Blanchard, now a four-star general, attended a reunion dinner in Roswell, and the incident had not been forgotten. Uh, he had been the commander here in 1947, and uh, I was at a table with the, the general and several other locals when they were interrogating him about the 1947 incident, and uh, he declined to, to answer uh, any of the questions except he did comment that it was the damnedest thing he'd ever seen. He never would discuss it, but several, several months later, one night, uh, I badgered him again, as I like to do, and he said, well, and then he paused, he said, I'll tell you this, and I'm paraphrasing him because I don't remember exactly how he said it, but in essence, he said, what I saw, I've never seen before. Okay, I'm Judd Roberts in Roswell. And I was the a minority stockholder and the manager of a radio station here back in those days. Radio station KGFL. Okay. And uh, we we had we got word of it with the rancher himself. Word of the crash. Oh, I beg your pardon. Of this UFO. Uh huh. Of course, there was a release that came out of Walt Hot's PIO department out at Walker Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so you were aware of something going on oh, out oh, there, definitely. Yeah. And, and then directly from Walter's press release or other sources. Other sources. I don't know whether I should say this or not, but it was true. We hid out the rancher for one night. We had him out at Mr. Whitmore's house here in town. He lived out outside of the city limits on the east side. What you're saying is that Whitmore never told you what the rancher said? Oh, he did just just plain discussion, but mm -hmm. but the rancher didn't say much. The rancher really said, hey, I was out and I was riding and I saw this and this is what it looked like and I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I came to town to tell some people and mentioned it to some people and pretty soon there was great interest. And so I don't think that, that he himself went in there and did a lot of pseudo-scientific experiments with this material. That, that next morning, Whitmore decided he wanted to go out to the crash site. No, I decided that. You decided. I wanted to go out because, because, because they, Whitmore had been out there. They, been out to the crash site? Or? Yeah, I think, but I don't know. He couldn't get any closer than I did. I thought we could do it with a back road or something. So you followed the back roads out toward sure. Corona. Sure. What happened when you got out toward the well, crash well, site? Well, they just had some roadblocks, that was all. And they just say, sorry, the road's closed. This is a restricted area. And, and I was more interested in just getting out there and disappointed because Believe me, we didn't get close. How, how close did you get, roughly? I'd, I'll bet I wasn't within 15 miles. We wanted we wanted to see the stuff we heard about. It. And of course, by that time, it was all picked up. Certainly that day. You said the stuff you heard about. What did you hear? What did you recall? Well, one of the things that I still remember specifically is that the material, they said, was as thin as a wrapper on a lucky strike package but you couldn't break it 
and if you twisted it and scrunched it up together, it would it would come back to its own deal. I was trying to run the station at that time. Mm -hmm. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, "You, are, we, we understand that you have some information, and we want to assure you that if you release it on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy, and so we suggest that you not do it. So you got the phone call from Washington? Yes. Yes, they and they, they told you that your license was in jeopardy. Did you? They did, they indicated that that would be a, a, a very negative thing. At that particular time, you didn't go around wrestling with the FCC if you could help it. They gave you enough trouble on, on other things, sitting out on a hill and monitoring you with a lousy 250 watts at that time. Or ASCAP was out there trying to find if we were playing some of their stuff and not reporting it. So we had all of the government that we needed. Around the station, what was the general reaction to the weather balloon story? <laughs> well, the weather balloons were being launched about a block from us every night, and from the because they did that with the uh, they did that with the uh, the uh, weather bureau at that time. That's how they got their readings. So weather balloons per se were not that not that interesting to us. You were saying you knew Mac Brazel. Yes. He was a neighbor. Yes. And uh, you lived out near his ranch in the summer of 1940. The ranches joined on the corner. They cornered. Okay. And what happened to him in Roswell? Did he ever talk to you about that? Very secretly. And he didn't talk to me a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were around my table. Um, Mac and I don't know whether Bill Brazel was there or not. I don't remember that. But. Um, Mac and my kids and Lyman, and I was busy carrying the coffee pot. <laughs> and he, uh, he, he was held for, I believe it was three days or three nights. Of course, ranchers all had livestock in their corrals that had to be fed, and Mac was there by himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he called Bill, Bill was in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. He'd come down and take care of his livestock, but they literally threw him in, in jail. Anyway, they came down here to the Bureau of Land Management together, and uh, they saw Mac being escorted by two, I believe, two army men. Mac was very secretive, and I know that he made it plain that um, he was not supposed to tell this and not supposed to tell that. And I think most of what he was not supposed to tell was that there was any excitement about this material. Did he talk about the material? Uh, yes, he did. I remember he said something about um, that you could crumple it up and it would come right back out. But Mac was pretty unhappy? Oh, you bet. He was a man who uh, had integrity. Um, he was, he definitely felt insulted and, and misused and disrespected. The whole neighborhood was scandalized that the army, that the services would treat people like that. People who had good intentions. What, what, what did your father do in Roswell? My father was the sheriff of Chance County. What about Mac Frizzell? What happened to him during this period of time? Well, the Air Force took him right away, and and uh, he really never came back to the sheriff's office. And the material was left there, and the Air Force picked it up and, and took it away. And then then and then that was the end of it. Your father described to either of you what this material that Mac Frizzell brought in looked like. It did not to me. He said. Um, he brought some material with him, and, and some junk, like, I don't know what it is. That's the best I can do about what his words were, right. just about briefly. Well, they I, had I the metal no in that office, in the small office over there, with the door shut. Nobody went in there. Uh -huh. It was locked. And the Air Force picked it up, uh -huh. 
and took it. Father's office? Yes, yes, and took it and said, don't you say another word about this. They had a little meeting in there when they picked it up, and after they had all the jeeps, and they, like they said, there was probably three people. But see, I did see them. I don't know who they were either. I wouldn't have known. Did you shot. see them, Elizabeth? No, well, would your father have known a weather balloon if, uh, if that's what, what it was? We recognized oh, I think so. Oh, yes, yes, we I had all, them all on our ranch. Uh, uh, they're little square boxes, and uh, you can uh, the balloon just just deflates. It's just and you pick them up. Uh, there's been a number of them. They have a place that you can send them back to the yeah. Air Force, and they do said, that now. He, he, as far as he was concerned, from what you know, that this was not a weather balloon? Oh, no, I don't think it was. They said it was a no. The of extraterrestrials are good. Philip Class, the military expert, disagrees. The fact of the matter is that it was not a weather balloon as such. It used a weather balloon as a vehicle. But what it was is called a radar corner reflector. It's an object that is roughly hexagonal so that it can be tracked by radar and no matter what angle this hexagonal thing is pointing it always returns a strong radar echo what do you think happened at roswell uh I think roswell new mexico the one that's the big one july yeah. 1947 the uh, ufo crashed yeah i think it's what the what they said it was it was uh that uh those balloons that they were using to detect uh, Russian nuclear bombs mm -hmm. in the atmosphere, and it was a secret program, so they weren't allowed to tell anybody about it. So they came in, they picked up the remains of the balloon, and then the story just uh, took off. It's a f that's a funny one, though, boy. That's that's made a whole town like, yeah. famous for UFOs. If you go there now, they have like alien themed gift shops. And They're milking it. It's like yeah. you said earlier, like people make money out of something. And then they get stuck into that. So because, yeah. because they're making money out of it, they're motivated. Yeah. It's easy to lie to the American people. And it's quite easy to lie to the American public because they don't do their homework and they don't pay attention. We're striving to have what we call uh, open hearings. We want them on C-SPAN. We want the doors to be open. And we have asked Congress individually, in many cases, to grant us congressional immunity for violating our security oaths so those of us in the old boy network can tell the congress congress can tell the congressional representatives can tell the people what we've seen and what we've learned that, that okay, seems bring to those guys in here yeah Let it seems to raise talk. a question if and, they've and, got and, and 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 by telling you that they have uh you know whistleblower protection or something that's bogus until it's in the law for us to just sit here and talk about it is bogus and that and and you really need to provide them with some some sort of uh, ability to be, come in here and not be persecuted and not have a blemish on their records.